broken, here for the strong. Here in this temple we belong. Here in our hearts, here in our lives, our God is here. And we cry, holy, holy, holy are you. We cry, holy. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. And friends, as we gather together to celebrate these sacred mysteries, let us pause to call to mind our failings. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgive us our sins. Christ, Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you feed us with your body and blood. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who hath prepared for those who love you good things, which no eye can see, Fill our hearts, we pray, with the warmth of your love, so that loving you in all things and above all things, we may attain your promises, which surpass every human desire. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Proverbs. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up her seven columns. She has dressed her meat, mixed her wine. Yes, she has spread her table. She has sent out her maidens. She calls from the heights out over the city. Let whoever is simple turn in here. To the one who lacks understanding, she says, Come eat of my food and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness that you may live. Advance in the way of understanding. 
The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, watch carefully how you live, not as foolish persons, but as wise, making the most of the opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not continue in ignorance, but try to understand what is the will of the Lord. And do not get drunk on wine, in which lies debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and playing to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks always and for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God the Father. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man 
and drink his blood, do not have life within me, within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, peace be with you. Have you ever walked into a church and felt like you really weren't welcome there? I was talking to a friend about a trip he and his family recently took to rural Wyoming and where they were looking for a church to be able to worship on Sunday. He's one of those Catholics that never misses unless if sickness or impossibility. Yet they almost did this weekend. From their first step into the small church, they felt like darts, people perusing their every move as they walked down the aisle. They sat in a pew near the front, as was their normal practice at home, only to be asked a, little, a few seconds later by a lady if they could sit somewhere else because they were sitting in her pew. So they moved to the next available pew that could accommodate them, which was closer to about two-thirds of the way back. Not so good for kids that are trying to pay attention. No one announced the music numbers, but the family decided to sing along anyway with the opening song, which was Amazing Grace. It also meant receiving the evil eye from several congregants that were close by because it seemed no one sang any of the music aside from the musicians. And no one really participated in any of the mass parts, aside from a few folks sitting in the front row, judging by the looks of, the, the, of surprise by those sitting around him when their five-year-old boisterously responded, and with your spirit, to the priest. Everyone looked to make sure they put money in the basket at the collection time, and paid close attention to make sure they received communion correctly. As the concluding hymn kicked up, the priest sort of ducked out the side with the altar servers, and the family turned around and realized that everybody behind them had already left the church. They started for the doors and found everyone that was in the back few pews in small circles of conversation, closed off from the rest of anybody else. Of course, they had really no intention of trying to walk up and break up these small circles, but instead, they headed for their van to get back to the campground that they were staying at. All at once, out of the side door, came the same lady who had evicted them from her pew. The wife of the couple saw her first and tried to push the family a little quicker toward the safety of their minivan, but the pew lady was spry and determined. She approached and said, gosh, it's nice to have such a beautiful young family come to church. I just don't understand why more young families don't come. <laughs> Our readings today focus on how the Eucharist forms us into a community. Both the first reading and second emphasize that the Eucharist is a banquet to which we are invited by God as both a prerequisite and a source of wisdom. In other words, we are supposed to know what it is that we are eating and live lives worthy of being invited to the banquet of God. And I feel like it's important to point out that when wisdom is personified in the book of Proverbs, the writer deliberately describes wisdom as a woman, and that this is a very typical uh, typification in the Old Testament. However, it should also be noted that folly 
the opposite of wisdom, is also personified as a woman. The book is written from the perspective of, of a father teaching his son about how there will be various good and evil influences in his life. Folly, in other uh, passages, is portrayed as a woman of the night, constantly trying, trying to lure the son away from a life based on worshiping pleasure, wealth, and power. Wisdom, on the other hand, invites and uh, welcomes people to a life of holiness. Wisdom reaches out to the simple, in other words, to those who have no power, wealth, and whose life is often the most drudgerous and complicated. She invites them through the meal to advance in a way of understanding toward wisdom. And what is that way of understanding? Jesus answers this question for us in the Gospel. Now bear in mind, we are beginning to complete the Bread of Life discourse in the Gospel of John, this lengthy reading from chapter 6 that has taken us the previous four Sundays to begin and complete, although technically we won't complete it until next week. Remember that the whole thing started because some people knew that Jesus had taken baskets of leftover bread after the feeding of the 5,000 and were hoping to share some of his leftovers. Jesus, in the meantime, has been clarifying for them what the bread means. First, by identifying it as superior to the bread of Moses given to the Israelites in the desert of the Old Testament, and then telling them that it was his body and blood. The words he uses are extremely graphic when he says body and blood, by the way, so much so that the Jews would probably have walked away from him because it would have been against their religion to eat meat cooked in its own blood. So no blood soup for our Jewish brothers and sisters. Jesus continues this message and picks up adding a couple of different things in today's gospel passage. First, that the bread is God's gift of eternal life. That it is, in fact, our entrance through the Eucharist into the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. And second, that by eating his flesh and drinking his blood, we remain in him and he remains in us. This puts us into a relationship through Jesus with the Father. Now, even though I've decided to say that these are two teachings that Jesus is giving us today, they're really, as I imagine you can see, quite interrelated. To receive God's gift of eternal life, we must receive the body and blood of Jesus in the Eucharist. And that, in turn, puts us into a relationship with God through Christ in the Holy Spirit as members of the Church. But to receive the Eucharist, we must already also have some kind of relationship with God. Now this can seem a bit catch-22-ish, but let me assure you, there's actually a necessary organic component to this that is important. It's not as though someone can be a scoundrel in every facet of their life, but come to church, sit for an hour, receive the Eucharist, and just barely squeak into heaven through some technicality. We aren't a church of the just barely. 